Well, greetings, everyone. I'm David Arendale, and I get to share with you today some highlights about an important peer learning program that's used throughout the United States, and it's called the Emerging Scholars Program. It's part of six different national and international models, which I follow, Emerging Scholars Program, and then along with the other ones. I'll end up be doing a separate video to give you highlights of each of them, um, so check with this podcast and also with the YouTube channel for the other episodes. What's the definition of ESP? It's a very highly organized workshop, which is attached to a very rigorous course that's a gatekeeper for many students in high-demand STEM majors. So it tends to be something that is very rigorous It oftentimes occurs inside of math classes. And what they're trying to focus on often, the focus student group, are those who are historically underrepresented. As you see in the second point down there, it's developed by Dr. Treisman back in the 1970s at Berkeley. The focus was on African-American students completing their doctoral programs in mathematics. Hardly any of them were being completed. And there was lots of structural, cultural uh, reasons why that, that was occurring. The campus was not providing a supportive environment. Dr. Treisman came up with an approach that looked at this in a little bit different way, and that's what we're going to be exploring here. The goals of ESP, well, we want to increase the graduation rates of students who are historically underrepresented. This could be women. This could be African Americans. Whatever population historically is not doing well within an academic degree program could be a focus of an ESP approach. It's now been expanded for a larger number of student populations. It takes a lot of resources, so it tends to focus on smaller groups of students rather than trying to be something which is done for all of the students uh, in the first year. The major assumption is one that's really difficult, and that is it's dealing with this issue of stereotype threat. One of the problems sometimes with academic support programs is they come up and present themselves to a student population group that historically has not done well at the institution. And they say, well, we have a solution for you. You're at risk, take our program, and you'll be more likely to graduate. Unfortunately, that ends up creating something which Dr. Claude Steele named after his research, the stereotype threat. You end up creating an environment where students who did not think of themselves as being at risk or not having a likely success rate for completion actually end up academically underperforming what they ought to actually be doing. So whenever they created the Emerging Scholars Program at Berkeley, it was viewed as an honors and an enrichment program for this student population group. You'd say, well, how in the world did they do that? Well, it was done through a number of nuances. One would be the kinds of advertising which they promoted to the students. It was an invitation. They had a reception for the students along with high-level administrators at the institution there at the reception talking to them about how they've been specially selected for this enrichment program. They were able to create an environment to where this was not looked at as being a negative but actually being an enrichment for their future. Well, what are the kinds of requirements that you need to have in order to be able to implement something like this? Well, it takes top-level institutional leadership. This can't be something that an individual faculty member does by himself. It ends up taking an enormous amount of resources from the institution from the top down in order to be able to create this. It takes a lot of support not only from the academic department, but also the academic unit itself then. It also requires a fair amount of salary support or uh, course releases for the faculty members because they're going to be intimately involved with helping to create the curriculum that goes on. 
also providing supervision, also working with the student leader who ends up running these workshop sessions. And because of the skill set that is needed, it really requires a graduate student to be able to run these workshops. And also you need to have some predictable workshop space. This goes on for four hours every week. So there's a heavy commitment by the institution, by the faculty member, and by the participating students. So actually what happens during a workshop? Well, it's mandatory participation for the students inside. You're to be there four hours a week. It's a graduate student who's going to be trained to be the facilitator of this. Probably the heart of the sessions are the challenging worksheets, which are both easy, hard, and medium level. So students are being continuously challenged, and part of what the focus is, it's about the process. It's not just about finding the answers, but also it's about the process, and also for you to begin to start developing some confidence in yourself that you can be successful. Lots of work that goes on inside of the workshop is done at the individual, small group, large group activity. In fact, oftentimes students work individually on their worksheets, then they come together in pairs, and then they work in small groups and then finally the large group. And that's part of the reason why it ends up taking four hours a week for you to participate in these. Also, this is a place for you to be developing the kinds of skills you need and be successful in the class. So also, in a sense, you can say that it is somewhat also, you could call it, manage study time. We're trying to make things more efficient for the students, but also we're dealing with incredibly rigorous courses. The very first course that this was piloted with in Berkeley was a calculus course. There's also another component of ESP, and that which goes on outside of the workshop. Because what Dr. Treisman understood was that there's also a campus culture issue. Sometimes they're not tremendously supportive of historically underrepresented or first-generation students. Not so much that it's a discriminatory environment, it's just simply that it's not sensitive to their needs particularly in the social dimension. So that's the reason why it was really important to create a social support cohort as well as an academic support cohort for students. It's for them to be able to start seeing themselves as being successful and seeing themselves in future careers. Also making sure that they stick with their academic majors. One of the unstudied issues in student retention is are students staying in the academic major that they really wanted to be in or do they transfer to something else? And that's something that is not well studied. There's an awful lot of students of color and women who transfer out of the sciences, out of the STEM majors, in fact, as a group, and they end up going into other majors and they graduate from the institution. So if you look just only at your demographics of your students who graduate from an institution, you really haven't gone deep enough. You really need to look at, did they graduate from the academic majors and programs that they really wanted to do so? They knew that it was really important to have a strong peer support network. And then also there's some social bonding. If you end up looking at the dissertation for Dr. Trice, many talks about the pizza parties. That seems to be something that might seem trite, but it's not. We often get together with other people over a meal, and we have conversation, and we feel supported, and we feel encouraged. I remember that was same thing was created for me for my own doctoral program, was getting together every three weeks for pizza and the graduate office for us to be able to share what's going on, provide encouragement, provide some accountability to other people for what we are working on. So this oftentimes, this social support cohort is oftentimes something which is not observed or attempted by other programs. 
Now, the ESP program is known by a variety of other names. You know, it was most often called the ESP back in the 80s, but also, as you see here from this wide list, Gateway Science, Math Workshop, Professional Development Program, Mathematics Workshop, that was actually the original name. And think about that in terms of Dr. Steele's um, uh, issue about stereotype threat. That looks like an interesting title, doesn't it? Professional Development Program Mathematics Workshop. Certainly doesn't sound remedial. Doesn't sound like it's made a bad comment about the student's capabilities. It's talked about professional development. It's also called, as you can see there from other institutions, Max Excel, Excel, Merit, and then sometimes it's just called the Treisman model then. Well, how have you evaluated this whenever you look at the literature? Well, it's had high success rates. It's also a smaller program, but it takes an awful lot of resources. You don't have to change institution-wide policies. That's not required. You may need people involved at higher levels of the institution to come by and be present for meetings and receptions and such. But this is something that doesn't require you to make massive policy changes at the top of the institution. It takes um, some evaluation. It's important, and you may end up needing to get some external help in order to be able to do that. It takes a lot of faculty time, a lot, a lot of time. It takes that graduate student. It takes salary for people. And then the bottom line is this one down here, highly effective for increasing success of historically underrepresented students in high-demand academic majors. So what it comes down to, what are you willing to invest as an institution in order to see certain student groups are successful? You know, the question isn't always, what is the cost of implementing? The other question is, what's the cost of failure? And that sometimes helps to motivate people to say, well, maybe the investment of money is worth it. Here's simply just a list of a few publications that you might want to take a look at if you want to know more about the ESP program. Since there's not a unified training center for ESP in the United States, and since there's a lot of diversity of names for what the ESP-like programs are called, it's sometimes it's hard to find all of their publications. So I'll have to admit that I probably have missed some. If you'd like to read more about ESP, well, it's part of my annotated bibliography of these peer learning programs. There's something like 1,550 or so of these publications that you can take a look at, and I have it broken down by the different program types. So if you only want to read about ESP, well, you can do that, or you can read about the other ones. The key is, is going to this particular website here, z.umm.edu slash peerbib. And if you go to there, you can be able to get into the annotated bibliography, read um, the research papers and studies that have been done on ESP, and learn much more detail about the program than just this really brief overview of me. Also, if you'd like to see more resources about peer learning, here's four of them that I maintain. I already talked to you about the peer bib. There's also that same thing, z.umn.edu, peer learning. Or you can read anything that I've written about peer learning programs. I've written most often about supplemental instruction and a hybrid program we developed here at the University of Minnesota called Peer Assisted Learning. And then finally, we have a YouTube channel where we have videos of interviews of leaders, student leaders of these peer learning groups, along with other videos that I've developed, including separate videos that look at all of those other programs uh, that share common characteristics. So if you'd like to be able to communicate with me, you see my contact information here down on the bottom. 
I wish you well as you continue to look at peer learning programs. I think it's one of the most exciting things that's going on in higher education today. Well, thanks for listening, and I hope my words are useful in your work in helping students to achieve their dreams. Best wishes.